So I would like to introduce our next speaker and our next topic, Dr. Mustafa Shara, a friend and colleague of mine who is a consultant neurologist at Sheikh Khalifa Medical City. Uh, he will be talking, us, talking to us today about diabetic neuropathy. Dr. Shara, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Ahmad. Do you hear me? Yep, I hear you loud and clear. Okay. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening, everybody. My talk here today is unusual because usually I used to present about headache or MS. So today, Dr. Shatila asked me to present about diabetic neuropathy. This is my disclosure. Projects is the general disclosure, nothing in this lecture related to any of these companies. This is the outline of the presentation. It will go for through introduction, clinical feature, epidemiology, classification, treatment, and conclusions. So I'll start with the, the by definition, the diabetic neuropathy is existing of some symptoms related to peripheral and neuro uh, uh, neurological symptoms related uh, to PNS with sign or without sign on background of having uh, diabetes mellitus of course as usual after exclusion of any other causes the exclusion is the usual uh, component in any the neurological definition as you know so this is just uh, the classification of diabetes how, how to diagnose diabetes majority of you are aware of this uh, criteria so i'll go now further so diabetic neuropathy currently is the most common in neuropathy in developed countries. We used it during our medical study to know about that or to, to be informed that the most common in neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy in, in the world is librosy, related to librosy. I haven't seen any librosy case in all of my life. So what we know now from statistics that diabetic body neuropathy, in fact, truly is the most common neuropathy in any countries, developing and developing countries. The percentage is about 10 to 100 percent of diabetic patients. It depends on methodology and definitions. 50 percent of patients with diabetes certainly and they eventually will develop a neuropathy or neuropathic complaint. And at time of diagnosis, uh, of type 2, what we know that 8% of uh, population of diabetic neuropathy at time of diagnosis having uh, symptoms or complaint related to peripheral neuropathy in comparison with sex or uh, beer matching in the community without any disease. Uh, so still it's a leading, uh, is, is, this is very important in fact, it's a leading cause of disability related to lower limb and it is reducing the quality of life due to pain and ulceration, gait instability, fracture, amputations, as probably it was highlighted by uh, the uh, by uh, statistics from WHO. As you can see, diabetic stomatitis comes at the number six, and the, the diabetic diabetes-related lower extremity complications still in the top 10, far above the other disease, common diseases like heart disease or kidney disease. As any other disease, also it has risk factors. Some of them are modifiable, some of them are non-modifiable. On the top of modifiable, the risk factors uh, come the poor glycemic control, as we'll see later on, alcohol, hypertension, cigarette smoking, and hypertriglyceridemia. And one majority of them, of course, as you know, are parts of the metabolic syndrome. Non-modifiable risk factors include age, male sex, height, family history, and larger duration of the disease. And as you know, also a boy, a boy genotype of many of the patients. When it comes to the classification or type of uh, neuropathies during uh, diabetes, we have this class. We are using this uh, classification that was uh, published as a statement from the American Diabetes Association. We have diffuse neuropathy, which include multiple types. On the, on the top of them, the most common type, which is distal symmetric body neuropathy. And then we have autonomic neuropathy, which is beyond the scope of this uh, presentation. We have also mononeuropathic and body radiculopathy, which is extremely rare, but still we see or encounter some cases of this condition in the neurology clinics. This is illustration explain the types of neuropathy. 
I think I will use here the indicator. Oops. Okay, as you see, this is the peripheral neuropathy. This is symmetric peripheral neuropathy here, the type. This is polyradiculopathy. This is lumbosacral, and this is brachial. And here, uh, uh, mononeuritis, multi, uh, and here, mononeuritis, multiplex. When it comes to pathogenesis, the usual or the standard uh, explanation that we used to learn or we learned about it during uh, medical school, during even early times of practice, that this is an ischemic uh, uh, pathology, that it includes a reduction of, uh, of the oxygen tension and the perf blood perfusion to the endoneural uh, and uh, fiber of the, of the, of the nerves. It comes like batchy and focal areas. It includes also the small vessels. So it's type of vasculitis with the, uh, in, what's include the hypoperfusion and hypo, uh, hypoxia to the small fibers of the nerve. However, over the past probably 20 or 30 past years, there was a lot of accumulation data that is more, it's more probably metabolic related to metabolic factors and accumulation of multiple toxic uh, products related to uh, this metabolism of the uh, of the uh, glucose and uh, uh, products related to this toxic uh, environment around the the, the uh, nerve itself, which includes also increasing of oxidative stresses. However, we know now that this is not easy to separate, that this is ischemic pathology or this is metabolic pathology. As you can see from this graph, it is very interchanging and interacting. So it is, it is in fact, uh, both of them, both of the factors, metabolic factors and ischemic factors, both of them are contributing to pathogenesis of diabetic neuropathy, still considered as micro, uh, microvascular angio, uh, complication of diabetes. Still, uh, yet we know some type of, uh, of uh, diabetic neuropathy like diabetic cachexia is mainly related to metabolic uh, dysfunction. While when we go to uh, a presentation like diabetic lumbosacral radicular polyradiculopathy, it's almost a pure vascular or ischemic patho in pathogenesis. Going to symptoms and complaint, it has variable presentations, and this could be explained by, by the types of nerves that are involved in pathogenesis. We know there are multiple types of nerves are involved in pathogenesis or symptomatology of the diabetes. If the uh, large myelinated fibers are involved, then we expect some motor dysfunction, some numbness, and uh, some unsteadiness related to this type of here, as you can see, this, this type of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of nerve, which is considered like large, and there is myelination around here. When it comes to a small, fi small myelinated fiber, as here, you get symptoms like pain, paresthesia, or thermal sensory uh, the, uh, complaint. When it comes to small now, unmyelinated fiber like this one, you get as again painful uh, paresthesia and dizziness, and occasionally syncope as part of cardiovascular autonomic dysfunction in during in diabetes mellitus. When when we are talking about bedside exam, the most important sign is the absence of anchor reflexes. Don't expect that patient is suffering from uh, generalized air reflexia. It, if it's happening, it will happen in advanced conditions. There is again uh, a lot of other uh, complaint uh, related either to sensory complaint or or to motor complaint. But anyway, in the early stages, you expect only to find the uh, absence of uh, anchor reflex with some uh, symptoms related to 
sensory deficit. As I said in the early presentation, when when we come to the to the, the diagnosis, there is complaint of sensory or motor on background of diabetes with exclusion. And as you can see, this is small exclusion just from American family practitioners. I see in journal, it is very small part. And if you go to any uh, neurological textbook, you will find probably almost five folds of this. Uh, of this uh, differential diagnosis and more uh, diagnosis than this. But anyway, usually there is no, uh, not a, a lot of differential diagnosis. Most of the cases are straightforward, but we have to understand, especially when we find uh, atypical representation with generalized areflexia, we have to think about CIDB, which is the uh, uh, which is most common, as you can see from this graph, is among diabetes as five-fold than in by general population. So in the occurrence of CIDB, chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, is almost five-fold occurring among diabetes other than the general population, as you can see again from this here, from this graph, comparing this is among patients with diabetes, here among patients with uh, general population. So this is probably the most important notice. You can, you can uh, give attention or pay attention when you're examining patient with with uh, diabetic neuropathy. You find generalized reflexia. You find something like atypical representation, especially for involvement in the upper limbs. Again, it, it, you have to in fact think about uh, CIDB, and in this case, it, it's better just to refer this condition to a neurology clinic. So the most important or the most common, uh, in fact, uh, type of diabetic neuropathy is the distal symmetric diabetic neuropathy, as you can see here in this graph. So diagnosis, in fact, uh, goes through the, the different uh, clinical categories, but we can say that it is possible when we have only either symptoms or, or sign. We have ankle absent or we have some hyperesthesia, some numbness or tingling in feet. It is the probable when we have symptom and co and in same time signs. Most important is complaint as this one here mentioned, and either neuropathic complaint or decreased distal sensation, uh, also absent reflex in the ankle. Now we say it is confirmed when we have symptom in addition to signs, in addition to a neuroelectrophysiological findings by nerve conduction study. The most important part, in fact, of this uh, classification is the last one, subclinical, because usually patients are exposed to some uh, dangerous complications without having any complaint or symptoms. And usually in this case, we detect the uh, the diabetic neuropathy only by nerve conduction study. There is no absent of the reflexes. There is no either complaint. But patient, in fact, suffering from ulcers, from swelling, from edema, from cellulitis, and from many injuries. So they do, they are not aware. They don't have any complaint. This is most serious and most uh, important uh, type. This is how we diagnose. Again, as I said before, the, the symptoms are, com are related to the type of nerve that is involved in pathogenesis of the diabetic uh, uh, neuropathy. And again, the examination and most important uh, uh, probably sign is related to absent or reduced ankle reflex. Is it usually considered as, as easy diagnosis? Uh, I doubt. It's easy, generally speaking. But look at the study. The study had included uh, 24 experts in neuromuscular medicine, figures uh, from North America and Europe. Majority of them are, uh, in fact, the, the people who are publishing research and uh, chapters about diabetic neuropathy and other type of neuropathy. So they included uh, 12 of them and they ask them blindly by mask, where, as you see here, where distort the mask, the faces of patients, and they distort the, the, the voice, ask with them in this patient blindly for a couple of days and decide about having or not having diabetic neuropathy. And as you can find, there are a lot of variability for even every one of them. Like look, this uh, physician number one here, 
as you can see here. He gave with the, in the first day and second day, he gave the correct diagnosis in 16 patients. In second day, he gave the, the correct diagnosis in 18 patients. Where they are the same patients, by the way, just on in two visits, they were examined blindly. He even over diagnosed five in the first and five and in the second, and he has under diagnosed one. Look to number uh, probably 19 or number number three physician he did correct in 19 this guy is doing well in fact and in this both days he did very well number 16 again number six give so everyone is giving this for the same patient he saw them uh, in couple of visit and one day apart and the diagnosis was different from the first day to second day and remember these are people who are expert who are textbook yani, writer and uh, research, top researcher and investigators and broad majority of them are professors and teaching fellows in, in Europe. Uh, so this is the group, same of them. And the, 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 the conclusion of the, the study was in fact very much remarkable that individual phys physicians or neurologists clinical diagnosis was excessively variable between the first visit and second visit for the same patient and frequently inaccurate. Very, very, very interesting. So study physician diagnosis, uh, the study physician diagnosis from signs and symptoms were excessively variable and often were overestimated. So majority of us, in fact, same at them overestimating the diagnosis. But anyhow, this is, you remember, this is not an easy diagnosis. It is very common yet. It's not an easy diagnosis, even for the experts. So one of these group, uh, the doctor, Gordon Smith, who is one was of the 12 one, published this uh, article in the continuum of uh, neurology and asked this question, do all the patients need a nerve conduction study? The conclusion, in fact, not. You cannot, in fact, do the nerve conduction study for every patient. He put the, they put this criteria and if the case, the clinical presentation was atypical, you find a lot of motor symptoms, you have asymmetry. Remember that the majority of cases are almost symmetric. If it's rapidly progressive, usually it's not rapidly progressive. And if it's proximal, not uh, distal. I remember just said the, the distal, symmetric, sensory polyneuropathy. The other issue when you refer patient to a nerve conduction study, if the diagnosis is not clear, you don't have any, uh, if it's related to diabetes or related to renal dysfunction of some medication or whatever, you, it's better just to send. So in this few cases, probably it's better just to send for, uh, for, for nerve conduction study. Remember, nerve conduction study is abnormal only in 70% of population. Remember that in majority of cases where small fiber neuropathy, there, were, there are no findings, in fact, in nerve conduction study. And specificity, in fact, are lacking. So in a nerve conduction study, you don't get the diagnosis. You get the pathology, either axonal or demyelinating. But it doesn't tell you that this is diabetic or this is because of toxic medication or whatever. And again, remember, this is very discomfortable. It causes a lot of discomfort to patients, and it needs a lot of, uh, to control many of the covar uh, covariance, related to gender, height, temperature of the room, and according to the age, different readings. Other possibility of diagnosis is skin biopsy. Hardly we go to this, uh, to this investigation, mainly because we lack the, I think, the expertise in this field in pathology department. But anyhow, it is probably indicated only in the case of small fiber neuropathy it looks at the density of uh, of uh, epidermal uh, in the, of the neurofiber in the epidermal layer of the skin it has very high specificity and sensitivity by 70 to 80 percent now if you look at this figure when we are working up for for a diagnosis you have to do some blood tests in fact on top of the them they did uh, something related to blood tests, which are including ANA, ESR, serum protein electrophoresis, other, other vitamins, whatever. And as you can see here, this study looked at the performance of a neurologist and non-neurologist on in diagnosing and working up of uh, this type of patient and what they found that the neurologists, in fact, are doing better than other specialties when it comes to this type of, as you can see from, from the numbers here of the vision. Again, when it comes to nerve conduction study and EMG, again, the neurologist did better, as you can see here. 
the striking point and the very frustrating, in fact, uh, also neurologists order a lot of MRIs. Very strange what the correlation between MRI of the brain or spine or whatever to, uh, to the complaint that is related to peripheral neuropathy. Anyhow, you know that neurology now means MRI in many of, of, yani, ways of practice or understanding. So phenotypes usually of the, the distal symmetric or polyneuropathy include the painful type, which is on 20%. Usually it happened in the early of the, the disease and include the small fibers. And uh, it's again, uh, there is a normality of the nerve conduction study in, 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 in 40% or more. The balance, which is more common, occurs later on in the disease. And it shows the uh, demyelinating changes in the nerve conduction study. And usually, patients exist at, at higher risk for injuries and ulcers. Same as for a, sym uh, a symptomatic, which we talked about, uh, about it before that is related only to changes in, in, in nerve conduction study without complaint. Phenotype are not strict. So if someone started with painful type, it will not continue as painful type. Anyhow, we know that the, the, these uh, complaints are evolving over time. Early diabetic type 2 usual and pre-diabetes usually involve small fiber and uh, it is painful usually and mainly it's related to obesity, hyperlipidemia, and insulin resistance, while later on in the disease we get the painful type and usually it's considered as co correlated with poor control of diabetes and hyperglycemia. Nobody knows, in fact, why this patient is getting painful, where the other is getting uh, the painless, or why they are evolving from one, uh, from one uh, type to other type. The other part, other than distal, uh, distal cymatric, uh, we have uh, the mononeuropathy, sometimes included. We are seeing these types, but a uh, little bit uncommon than before the, the previous one. The most uh, common presentation here of mononeuritis, uh, of thermological mononeuritis, of thermological. Uh, 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 of thermological nerves involved, where you can find diptosis, double vision. And usually the third nerve valve she was sparing of the bibulary functions. Other either complaint in less uh, cases, the CTS, carpal tunnel syndrome, or a uh, common perineal palsy uh, with foot drop. The diabetic radiculopathy, uh, polyradiculopathy or radiculoplexus neuropathy, it is uncommon. It is usually in main with the type 2. It is usually unilateral with ex sudden onset with extremely pain. It's usually followed uh, a history of weight loss. And there is associated always with motor weakness. The nerve conduction study shows axonal changes. CSF shows uh, protein. Increasing in protein, this disorder usually is considered as a crisis for patients and very painful. However, it is usually self-limited. In some occasion, we prescribe IVIG or steroid, uh, although this, this, there is no uh, solid or robust uh, treatment or management plan according to the literature. This is very rare type is insulin neuritis or treatment induced neuropathy, hardly to be seen. It's even hardly to be appreciated by uh, even endocrinologists. I remember I saw one case in my life in, in 2016 when somebody was pushed into my clinic complaining, and it was Thursday, in fact, afternoon complaining of severe pain pushed by a colleague endocrinologist and outside of our hospital just to get more probably uh, brigabaline as a treatment. Anyway, this type is it's in fact rare. It is considered as iatrogenic. It's considered as small fiber neuropathy. Uh, it's related, in fact, to abrupt and poor movement. You, somebody comes to your clinic with high high HbA1c. You did your best. You reduce the HbA1c by high percentage, 20 or 30 or 40 percent. The patient ends in this very the painful type of a neuropathy, as you can see here. The guy which I, whom I saw him was almost like this one. So this is tell you exactly what here they, if you look at the sorry here why, why, how much you are reducing the 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 HPA1C over months and again the complaint of neuropathy and severity the more you are reducing the HPA1C and more faster over uh, uh, over short time 
you are getting worse complaint. If you reduce the HbA1c within like uh, two months or three months, the patient will be burned like this one here. So this study found that decreasing of, of uh, HbA1c by 44% at least over three months will increase the, the, the pain by at least 80% uh, in, in neuropathic pain in, in, in this patient. Uh, the natural history, in fact, it will resolve. It takes time. It is very painful. It is uh, it, it, it need a lot of uh, medications and narcotics, in fact, to control pain. However, it resolves usually uh, after after time. Unfortunately, natural history is not very well uh, known as due to the, the lack of information and lack of studies. The other type of uh, diabetic neuropathy is autonomic, which is beyond the uh, scope of this presentation. As you can see, the cardiovascular uh, autonomic neuropathy, the gastrointestinal and the genital and uh, sodomotor. And all these types are not, in fact, uh, treated or followed or diagnosed in the in a neurological clinic. Usually, they follow the the other the service that uh, the complaint related to. If there is nausea, bloating, uh, some uh, constipation, or whatever they follow usually uh, GI. If there's something, couple attacks, they go for cardiology. This is the most common complications, wound infection, joint, especially charcoal joint, muscle wasting, quality of life, as we saw, in bears, sleeping disturbances, sometimes depression and anxiety. Treatment our management goes for all of our four pillars, the prevention, relieving pain, managing of complications, and nerve repairing or growth. We'll go through all that. So on the prevention, it's better just to optimize the glucose control. We have good evidence on type 2 diabetes. Unfortunately, we lack this evidence for the type 2. We have good evidence for type 1. We lack the evidence for type 2. Lifestyle modification, the most important part is regular exercises and dietary modification, as we'll see later on. This is Cochrane Review had shown clearly that optimal or uh, close glucose control, in fact, among patients with type 1, as you can see, and with very good control of a neuropathy in patients with type 1 diabetes. It's not the same case with Type 2, as you see here, the effect was there was no effect for the glucose control or optimal or uh, tight glucose control among patients with type 2 diabetes and the neuropathy. This is a, a study that looked at the exercise and the diet in the pre-diabetic patient, as you can see here. The conclusion was a uh, discounseling and diet uh, modification with regular exercises after one year ended with improvement and the and the and the and the neuropathic renervation improvement and renervation as you can see here this is the brain as you can see find a lack a lot of uh, uh, nerves here where here a lot of nerve return or re in the epidermal area as you can see here the numbers are up. And here the number is up. This is in the proximal thighs. This is in distal uh, leg here. And the most importantly, even the score of pain reduced by, by this intervention. This is in the pre-diabetic patients, which all uh, I consider usually as carrying the same risk as diabetes when it comes to microvascular complications. This uh, again, same among diabetic uh, patients, but this time on, on uh, they looked at the regular exercises. And here you find again increasing on Shara, Yes. Five minutes remaining, sir. Three minutes? Five. Five. Okay, thank you very much. So renovation and the renovation was in fact compatible with even better when we are adding to the exercise control or control of metabolic uh, syndromes component like if we give a good control for one component or two or three of them it the uh, re-innervation is better uh, and the scoring of pain is improving this uh, slide is a meta-analysis done by american academy of neurology and it shows for you the most effective uh, pharmacotherapies and uh, they, what they found that the most effective medication are snris including duloxetine and villafaxin while when it comes to gabapentin, they found it not better than placebo, which is surprising for us all, in fact. Uh, this look, they looked at the multiple studies, a randomized control study, and they uh, give strengths for all evidence, and 
the finding that gabapentin, in fact, not effective and has very low, uh, very low type of evidence. Uh, the other, including uh, brigabalin, lidocaine, topical medica medication, emetrotin, all that are a little bit better than placebo. This is the, the pathway for diagnosis and referrals. So when patients complain in your clinic, in fact, this is for, for symptomatic therapy. Remember, it's better just to change a lifetime modification from diet and exercise. Now, if you go for pain and you treat the pain, you start with SNRIs, uh, deloxetine or venlafaxin, or you can start sometimes with brigabaline. Again, we can give noritriptyline in these cases. If there is no clinical improvement, you switch among them, or you make a combination. If there is no improvement, you can add a pretramadol, and if there is no improvement, you refer patient to a pain clinic. My conclusion, diabetic neuropathy might be no, uh, not at one diagnosis, Neuropathy occur uh, or prior even to, to the complaint or full diagnosis of uh, diabetes. Everybody knows this uh, probably uh, information. Distal symmetric polyneuropathy it, uh, is a clinical diagnosis by the end. It hardly, it, you hardly to send the patient, only in a few uh, atypical presentation. You have to pay attention to obesity and the hypercholesterolemia, hyperlipidemia, in order, in fact, to control neuropathy, especially in type 2. Exercise and life modifi style modifiers are giving positive uh, result and positive income. Usually, insulin neuritis is, in fact, underappreciated and the preventable painful syndrome. Thank you very much. This was my last time. Thank you very much, Dr. Shada, for the very interesting and educational lecture. Thank you. Uh, we do have some questions. Uh, Please. One question from Inas Salah Al-Fual. What is the biochemical reaction of polyneuropathy? What is it? The biochemical reaction of polyneuropathy. I'm kind of suspecting that different. it all depends on the cause, right? You um, know, like, Neuropathies will give you uh, neuropathy, but it's different than metabolic. What I, I don't understand, in fact, the question biochemical uh, reaction reactions for polyneuropathy. Yeah, like what's the, what's happening at a biochemical level at a cellular level? What is happening on biochemical level? I don't know. I am very bad as many clinicians in basic science. There is accumulation of toxic uh, products related to uh, this metabolism or of the of glucose and lack of insulin, and there is extra uh, oxidative stress around the nerves that causing, uh, in fact, ended by focal ischemic changes over the nerves and uh, demyelination, and then by by end uh, after prolonged uh, demyelination injuries, we find even axonal injuries. But uh, how it comes, the uh, chemicals exactly? No, I don't know exactly. I don't know. I don't know because I, this is what I am. I am very poor in, in this uh, very delicate, in fact, basic science. As many of us are. So I think but you answered it pretty, pretty perfectly. Uh, we have a question from Mehmet Akif BC. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing this wrong. I know that Mehmet is listening to us from Turkey, actually, today. Uh, do you experience tremor as a side effect with patients who are on gabapentin? Uh, uh, in fact, gabapentin, especially gabapentin, our group of patients are extremely minimal. I did not find the patients on gabapentin in our uh, patients who are following my clinic suffering from adverse event of gabapentin, still it is listed in the SMBAC of the, of, the, of the medication. I haven't seen any case in my practice. Same here. I think if you're on a high dose of gabapentin, I know that the, the daily maximum dose is 3,600 milligrams per day. Yeah. Sadly, to reach this, in fact, it is in my, it's not tolerated 
by majority of our patients. Even our patient doesn't tolerate 800 three times daily. And you know, as you said, that is probably the optimal dose to treat me, to give uh, effect on pain complaints in diabetic neuropathy at the highest dose. is not the lower dose. You cannot control the, the complaint by 100 two times or three times or even 400. You have to jump for more hours than 800 three times and majority of our patients, they don't tolerate this dose. It's too excessively sedating. Yes. Uh, a question from Ines again, Salah al -Fual. Have you ever uh, recommended any patients for radiofrequency ablation for their neuropathy? No, I heard about this, no, never, never. Same. I had one patient who did it once for trigeminal neuralgia, yes. but, but not trigeminal, for... Trigeminal occipital nerve sometimes, yes, but not for... for uh, trigeminal is more common, and uh, yes, I know many patients, but not for uh, diabetic neuropathy. Exactly, that's kind of similar to my experience. Um, I don't think we have... Oh, wait, there's one more question from Ayat Giara. What treatment after Lyrica would you prescribe if it's not effective? She took it for seven years. What would you give him? Usually, if there is failure of Lyrica, we go to deloxetine. We start now more based on the previous meta analysis that I presented. We we start we try to start patient on deloxetine and then go to Lyrica if there is no effective or no effect on the complaint. But if the patient already on, on Lyrica and they failed, we start them on deloxity. Very few patients, I think one or two in our group, they are on, on Effexor, Villafaxine, and uh, surprisingly, they are doing very well. Yeah, Villafaxine. Also, some people benefit from deloxetine as well for neuropathy. Yeah. Uh, Fatima Al-Kindi is asking a question. What is the best option for di diabetic dialysis? Oh, I'm sorry, a question came in. in there. Uh, diabetic neuropathy in a dialysis, wait, diabetic dialysis patient with neuropathy. Usually we give, in fact, lower dose of, uh, of brigabaline, uh, especially give uh, according to the renal function, we reduce the dose either every other day or every third day. 75 milligram, this is the only available dose. We don't have 50 milligram in this country. So we use even 75 either uh, every other day or every third day. Okay, uh, there's a private question here. It's it's a little general, I think. Burning sensation in the lower extremity. Uh, I think that could be a neuropathy, but the, the, the etiology, as you had discussed, it could be many, anywhere from vascular to toxic to metabolic to autoimmune. So if someone's experiencing burning sensation, uh, it's probably better to be evaluated by a neurologist, in my opinion. Certainly, yeah. In fact, this is yani, very difficult to complain when you get a patient with burning feet and you did all the workup, including blood tests, autoimmune. Sometimes you go to uh, even skin biopsy, you find nothing and you have to start the uh, non-specific treatment. And you repeat this exam every year again till you find the, the cause. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Madeleine de Leon ask the question of patient presenting with neuropathy more on the non-dominant hand non-diabetic with a family history of diabetes how do we first do with this patient or i think what do we do first with this yeah, patient? this is the usual uh, approach for uh, a neuropathy it's beyond the scope of this presentation again the neuropathy uh, neuropathic complaint as i understand this is mononeuritis right yeah that's what it sounds like, like mononeuritis. mononeuritis. You have to, have, in, in fact, confirm the diagnosis, do the blood work up related to mononeuritis. Usually, mononeuritis we have, we start usually with vasculitis. Then, depending on the electrophysiological findings, you go to uh, to find whatever. Sometimes it is an early part for a, a syndrome that is representing uh, some entities, and usually either CIDB or multi uh, MMN or other diagnosis. So it depends even on autoantibodies, on uh, autoimmune screen, on uh, nutritional deficit, on there is a big list in fact of, of investigations of the idiopathic uh, neuropathic presentation. Okay. 
Uh, there is a question from Prem Kumar Sinha. Uh, which is better, venlafaxine or duloxetine? I think I'm... I think they get received the same category of uh, uh, of uh, strengths and recommendation from the meta-analysis by American Academy of Neurology. Same of them are effective. Unfortunately, it is very hard, in fact, to, to prescribe Effexor or Vella vaccine due to insurance issues, as it is approved only for uh, for uh, the depression. By while, in fact, duloxetine has uh, two approval: one for neuropathic pain and one for depression. Uh, in my experience, patients who failed the Brillerica, who failed uh, duloxetine, we tried with them uh, Effexor. I have a currently a couple of patients are doing, in fact, very well on, on this medication. We have mm -hmm. only one in, on on migraine. Come on, even. Okay, interesting. Good to know. Asma Al Balat, when would you recommend to use IVIG? I think this is very much experimental. It is not recommended. It is on uh, polyradiculopathy or uh, or blixopathy, or uh, painful blixopathy in uh, as acute presentation in uh, in diabetic neuropathy. This type is rare. It is painful, it is associated with motor weakness, especially proximal motor weakness, sometimes wasting. And if the diagnosis is confirmed, we can go experimentally by giving IVIG. Uh, usually, if the patient don't, did not respond to symptomatic therapy and physiotherapy, we do this uh, in very rare occasions. Sometimes we give even high dose steroid. What the best, of course, uh, was admission and opti for optimal management of uh, blood glucose. As you know, the methylbenzolone increase uh, glucose extremely sometimes when it's given to diabetic patient. Okay. There is a question for, from Hamsa Paravi. What about the combination of duloxetine and pregabalin? Can be, of course. Of course, we use intractable pain. We give the, the intra, uh, sometimes in more than this, we give the docaine batches, we give tramadol, we give uh, 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 yani, uh, probably four or five types of medications in order to control some very rare, intractable, painful diabetic neuropathies. Thank you very much. And I think that concludes all the questions.